Hello, it's time for episode 21 of The Detective Diaries. This is where I share the most interesting, unusual, quirky finds from my house history research. My alter ego is the house detective and I research the history of houses. In this episode, I'm going to be showing you some beautiful historic real estate advertising posters and flyers, and I'll be explaining how these can be very useful when researching the history of your house and how I use them in my research. I research a lot of dead people as part of my work, but lately I have also been researching dead farms. So stick around and find out what a dead farm is. Next up, I'll be talking about the amazing Regent Theatre in Brisbane and how absolutely spectacular it is. And I'll be discussing a little bit about the architect that designed it. The history of the German club at Gabba in Brisbane is next up. And then finally, I'll be discussing an abandoned railway station in Brisbane. I hope you enjoy watching. When I start researching a house, and if it was built in an old area of Brisbane, one of the things I always look for are historical real estate advertising flyers. So the State Library of Queensland has a fantastic digitized collection of these images. And the reason I like looking for these is, first of all, it gives you a date for when the land was subdivided, which can be helpful because generally a house won't have been built before this date because the estates were sold as vacant land. But they also often show existing houses or existing buildings or shops, that type of thing in the local area. And they also often include a map of the local area, which can be useful for looking at what roads had been laid out by that date and other information along those lines. They also are usually so beautiful. So incredible fonts, gorgeous graphic design, and most of them are just so lovely to have a look at. If you're really lucky as well, and a big estate was sold in multiple stages, often the maps on them of the, showing the blocks of land will show which ones have already been sold or which ones have had buildings built on. So it can be very useful in terms of working out the date of construction of your house, as well as just being really interesting from a local history point of view. Sometimes too, they will have a drawing of the, you know, like a view over the estate, which is so cool. And I'm sure some of them um, have a little bit of artistic license taken with the views, but they often capture the land before it was developed with houses. And it, it sometimes it just blows your mind to see images of, you know, Norman Park, for example, where there's not a house to be seen. The other thing that I really love is if the estate is a subdivision of land that was part of a grand residence, then sometimes it also shows the location of the original residence that was part of the property. And that can be interesting if you're researching a really old residence. And also it's really interesting to track the pattern of the subdivision of the land in the area. But basically I just thought I'd show you a few of these because they're just super pretty. Um, and I know I've mentioned a couple of times now and I'm not by any means trying to do the hard sell, but I have a selection of these kinds of images in my shop as well and you can have them printed out to hang on your wall or you can have them printed out um, on various different types of merchandise and they do make really great presents for people if you can find one that is that captures their street or their suburb but basically here you go I'm just going to show you a selection and put some pretty music and you can have a look at some of my favorites <music> is a dead farm? Well, I uncovered the answer to this recently when I was researching a couple of properties up at Townsville, which were originally established as selections. A selection was basically where you had a portion of land and you leased it from the government. And in exchange for doing a number of what were called improvements on the land, so these were things like building fencing, clearing trees, um, building a house, obviously not necessarily improvement, particularly from First Nations perspective. But if you had undertaken these types of improvements and met the conditions of the lease, then you would become the outright owner of the land and you would be issued a certificate of title over the property. 
The records for whilst it was operated as a lease from the government are held at the State Archives. So you might remember from the last episode I mentioned that the State Archives, Queensland State Archives at Runcorn hold documents that relate to the operation of the Queensland government. So these files, <laughs> these files contain so much information. So if you're ever researching a rural property that started out life as an agricultural or a grazing lease, then these are a treasure trove of information. They will often have uh, the original application to the government for land, which includes the person's name and details. It will sometimes include things like uh, wedding certificates. If the lease owner has died and for example, their wife is um, applying to take over management of the lease, but they will always include a sketch map of the selection area. And sometimes if you're lucky, they will include a map that actually shows the location of the residents and other buildings that are located within the selection. Because as I mentioned, one of the types of improvements they had to undertake was generally building a house or a residence and actually occupying the land. So they're a really good source of information on rural properties, early rural properties. These records are part of a series that are called Dead Farm Files. And I thought that was a bit of a curious name and I actually um, had a look into why they were called this. And basically it was because once the person had fulfilled the condition of the lease, and they became the outright owner of the land and they were issued the certificate of title over the property. They were no longer leasing the land from the government. That's where the government's involvement in managing these properties ended. And so they were no longer active, they were dead. So as, um, and as one of my favorite archivists at the State Archives said, it was a lot easier to say dead farm file than it was to say expired agricultural lease file. I'm having trouble saying it now. So basically this whole series is known as Dead Farm Files and I don't know why, that just, um, that just tickled my fancy when I saw that name for a series. The Regent Theatre and the architect that designed it. I was researching a house at Clayfield recently and it turned out that the house had been designed by a Brisbane architect, Richard Gailey Jr. Now that name immediately uh, rang a bell in the back of my mind because Richard Gailey Sr. is responsible for designing so many commercial buildings in Brisbane. He had, um, not just Brisbane actually, Queensland, he was a very prolific architect and his work can be found everywhere. He mainly specialised in commercial buildings and so did his son who was also Richard Gailey. However, this is a very, un this house at Clayfield is a really unusual example of his residential domestic architecture. There's only one other example of a house designed by him that I could find that has been conclusively identified. And it's a real shame because his own house that he designed for himself was so spectacular. It was at Hamilton. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was a beautiful example of an interwar timber home, but unfortunately it was demolished and no longer survives. But I did find this incredible photograph of it and you can see just how spectacular it was. So this house I was researching is quite special. It's a very unusual example of his residential design. When I was researching Richard Gailey Jr. further, I uncovered that he was also involved in the design of the Regent Theatre in Brisbane. So he was better known, as I mentioned, for his commercial designs and his commercial buildings. Two of his best known commercial uh, de designs were the Regent Theatre and Brisbane Arcade, both on Queen Street, and they're actually uh, almost opposite each other. Some of you might remember there was a big battle to save the Regent because it was under threat of demolition. and the sort of compromise was that the front foyer area was retained but the rear of it that had originally contained the theatres themselves was demolished but that had, area had been reconfigured into multiple cinemas um, prior to that and modernised anyway. So the cinema opened in 1929 and it was designed by Gailey but another architect, Charles Hollingshead, was also involved and I suspect that he probably had the biggest hand in the design of it because he had designed other theatres for Hoyt throughout Australia. And interestingly, uh, the Regent Theatre in Melbourne is almost identical to what this Brisbane Regent was like. So sadly, as I mentioned, only the facade 
and the foyer of the Regent Theatre now survive and the building is used as the Brisbane Information Centre. But what a foyer. <laughs> the relatively plain facade of this building, although beautiful, in no way prepares you for the outrageous extravagance of the interior of the foyer. It is so over the top and so decorative and just so filled with incredible features. If, you, if you've never been in there, make sure you go and check it out. It's open to the public. Like I said, it's the information centre and it's also you can access the Brisbane, uh, Brisbane Business Hub through it. It's absolutely spectacular. It's a complete hidden gem. As I mentioned, you'd never suspect that this decorative masterpiece survives inside this building from the street. Now, it was, as I mentioned, opened in 1929 and the Regent Theatre was the place to be. It was one of the social hubs of Brisbane and there's so many newspaper reports on the opening of this building and describing how impressive it was and how luxurious and all the up-to-date modern features that it had compared to a lot of the older buildings in Brisbane and it regularly saw thousands and thousands and thousands of people come through its doors of a night time it was like I said just incredible and there's heaps of really cool ads uh, in the news old newspapers that show the different shows and um, performances that were being held there so it was an absolute institution of Brisbane social life for many many decades the cost of building it was 300,000 pounds in 1929 which is an astronomical figure for the period it probably translates to around about 30 million dollars today which is actually doesn't actually seem like that much I'd hate to think how much it would actually cost to recreate what is there now but it was an absolutely stunning building when it was built it survives as an incredible interior and it, what I find amazing is also when you compare this to other buildings that were being built in Brisbane around the same time so Brisbane City Hall is is a similar vintage and if you think it how you compare it to that classic restrained design and very um, you know serious imposing design of Brisbane City Hall it's just a riot of extravagance in comparison and one of the things I love about theatre architecture is that they did embrace this really over-the-top highly decorative style quite often and it was sort of a, a, a genre of architecture of its own. I still remember too there was a number of these old cinemas that survived in Brisbane well into the 80s and 90s. There was another one on I think it was also a Hoyts as well maybe you can remember and remind me in the comments it was on the corner of um, Elizabeth Street and Albert Street sort of opposite where the Maya Centre is now and it used to be absolutely beautiful inside as well so yeah I know a lot of us have a lot of nostalgia about these beautiful old cinemas so yeah make sure you post your your recollections and your memories in the comments below I'd love to hear them I also was excited when the Regent came up in my research because as you can see behind me I have quite a reference collection of architecture and history books and I knew that I had purchased this one many many years ago and it's absolutely stunning it's filled full of beautiful images of the building as well as a really detailed history of the region and where it fits in the architectural history of other theatres and into in our nightlife and some wonderful personal recollections of going to the theatre so I believe it's in the Brisbane City Council libraries if you want to have a look at it but it's it's a fabulous book it's by Michael Gillies and I used it as a reference for a lot of my research into the building but there you have it just basically a little love letter to the Regent Theatre from me I was recently hired by some clients to try and fill in some missing pieces in their family history puzzle the ancestors that they were particularly interested in were German immigrants and they knew that one of them had been a member of the German club in Brisbane and one of the avenues we were looking at exploring to try and uncover more information was uh, to try and find out if the German club holds any archival records of previous members because we were thinking we we're trying to track where they lived and we we're thinking 
well maybe the, these records would include their address. So I got in touch with the German club. Unfortunately they don't release that information to the public which is a real shame because it would be a treasure trove of information for family historians. But anyway um, I ended up finding some information for them from other sources and we ended up piecing together the story of these houses. But when I was in the process of contacting the German club I got a little bit sidetracked as you all know that I do and I was really curious about the history of this club. A lot of you may not know but German immigrants were actually the first free settlers in the Brisbane area. So I touched on this a bit in uh, I think it was a previous episode where I was talking about the transition of the convict settlement to Brisbane town and German immigrants were actually the exception to the rule that forbid free settlers being part of uh, being located within the Moreton Bay penal colony. A group of German missionaries were given permission to establish a mission at what was known as German Station but is now part of the suburbs of Nunda and Toomble. So they have been here from the very early days of European settlement. And I think that the history and contribution that German settlers have made to Queensland and Australia is such an unappreciated aspect of our history. They contributed so hugely in so many different ways to our history and to the development of our towns and cities and to even our architectural style. This contribution is so little celebrated I think part of that is because uh, as a result of the First and Second World Wars where anything German was considered to be a bit suspicious and I talked about that previously in an episode where people um, of Italian, German and Japanese background were held in internment camps during the Second World War because of fears for national security. So I think a lot of our German history was sort of pushed aside or covered up or not spoken about as a result of this and a lot of you will know Know that some places that had German names, streets, suburbs that had German names, they actually had their names changed to kind of um, paper over that German history and influence, which is a real shame because, like I said, they had such made such a huge contribution to the development and growth of our suburbs and our and are uh, such a huge part of our history, particularly in the Logan area. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. That's a whole other topic for a whole other video. But the German club was the was this, the social hub for many of these immigrants that settled in Brisbane. You could go there and you could speak to other people in German, you could share a good German meal and traditional meal and you could network amongst the German community. The German club is now located at uh, on Volta Street at Wool and Gabba. The German consul at the time, Johann Christian Husler, that name might ring a bell, I've mentioned him in previous episodes, it was the tour of Rosalie with Rob and also you may re recognize the name Husler Terrace. He donated this block of land at Wool and Gabba for construction of a German club and in, in about 1890 a new building was built there and it was spectacular. This building had turrets however it suffered a, another a terrible fate and it was apparently destroyed by white ants and it was demolished and then the current building was built in uh, in the 1930s and it's evolved and been extended and altered ever since but the core of that building is a 1930s building. So the story of this club and the story of the buildings where it's been housed turns out to be a fascinating story. I've been there a couple of times for lunch when I worked at the land centre at Wool and Gabba. I don't know if you remember that building, it's been demolished to make way for the Cross River Rail. I want to appreciate it from an architectural perspective but it was this big hulking concrete building and it was pretty ugly and unappealing and it was like going to Mordor every day when I worked there. I actually wasn't that sad when it got demolished but it was a it was a quite an interesting example of the brutalist style. But we went over to the German club for lunch a couple of times. So yeah, an interesting history of this club and the buildings that it occupied and um, it, I I like to think too like I've got uh, I think it was my great grandmother who was from Germany so did she visit this club? Did her relatives or friends visit this club as well? It's quite interesting to think and uh, one of the great things I found when I was searching for information on members was this fantastic poster that's held at the State Library of Queensland and it's from 1907 and it actually has portraits not just the names but portraits of the members at that date which I just thought was so cool and as my client who had hired me to research the ancestors said it's quite an impressive collection of moustaches if nothing else.
Okay, last but definitely not least is an abandoned railway station. So you might be thinking that this is on some defunct line in the middle of the country, but no, this is in the middle of South Brisbane. It, it, it still blows my mind a little bit. So it's Gloucester Street Station and some of you might remember when this was in operation. The Gloucester Street Station was located between Park Road Station and Vulture Street Station. Vulture Street Station is now South Bank Station. And these stations were opened as part of a new line that was put through to Corinda or South Brisbane Junction as it was originally in 1891. And this route was basically designed to cut off a really awkward section of line that went through Wool and Gabba and had a level crossing through the Wool and Gabba five ways, um, which was really inconvenient for everyone involved because the traffic all had to be stopped and then a guy would walk out in front of the train with his red flag and the train would be able to come through there. There's some great old photos of that. I'll, I'll see if I can find one, but some of you might actually remember when that was, when that happened. So basically this was just a more efficient alignment of the route. Gloucester Street Station was put in, um, as I mentioned, between Park Road and Vulture Street stations, and it was in operation for many years, but Basically, it, the use of this station declined. Um, once trains started to get longer and longer, the platform wasn't long enough anymore. And there's stories of them having to do the first unload of the first few carriages and then the train would move up and they'd unload the back carriages. And basically the final death knell was when they were looking at electrifying the Brisbane service and the trains were going to be much longer again. And this station is between a tunnel and a bridge and it was just going to be far too expensive to extend that platform and adjust the the tunnels or the bridge to make it able to serve make it able to serve these new trains so they decided to close down the station and it was closed in 1978 it's very overgrown but you can actually see the former platform if you have a look from the bridge that is actually on Gloucester Street you can look down on it and see the remnants of this station so otherwise you would have no idea that it was ever there there, but it does show up on a few old maps. And there's just something about abandoned railway infrastructure. I don't know, I worked for Queensland Rail for a while managing their heritage properties, but I remember as a kid catching the train from Brisbane to Sydney. And I remember on one of the trips seeing like an overgrown abandoned tunnel. And I remember being so intrigued by that. So that's probably where the seeds for the house detective were first sown. But I just have always loved abandoned railway buildings and lines and you know when you go out to the country and you go for a drive and you can see where the embankment for the railway was and you can see old bridges even though there's no railway lines there anymore. I just love that cool stuff. So yeah, I thought I would share this one with you because it's surprisingly right in the middle of Brisbane. Well that brings us to the end of episode 21 of the Detective Diaries. I hope you found it interesting and I hope that you've maybe learnt something or at least, as my dad would say, had a little bit of nostalgia for the old folks and I will see you next time.